Good morning, metalheads of the internet. It is very early in the morning. I'm very tired. But I love you, and I made you a promise. I told you we were going to, at some point in May, review every single Sepultura album. And I am a man of my word. A very tired man, but a man of my word nonetheless. So today we are going to review every single Sepultura album, including the Derek Green stuff, because controversy, con contrary to what some people would like to believe, Sepultura did in fact continue without Max Cavalera. It's going to be fun. Lots of cool gnarly tunes. As per the norm with every single reviewing every album style video, I am specifically looking at Sepultura's studio album discography. I am not interested in EPs, live albums, demos, or compilations. I will be talking about each album in order of release and assigning each a score out of five. Five being the best, perfect, a masterpiece, zero being, well, not that. Duh. They've got a pretty hefty, chunky discography spanning multiple subgenres, so let's not waste any goddamn time. Let's get started with Morbid Visions, the band's debut album released November 10th, 1986, via Cogumelo Records. I hesitate to say that this is a good album, but it's definitely an interesting album. Like, this Sepultura is very young, very primal, they're very heavily influenced by first wave black metal, namely bands like Venom and Celtic Frost. As a result, the album thematically is very dark, very hellish, very satanic. Uh, the production is very poor, almost on par with the very primitive recordings I expect from like some second wave black metal bands in the late 80s. Sepultura were also only starting to learn English at this point, so from what I understand, they wrote the songs word for word with an English dictionary, basically translating as they went along. And all of this makes for a record that I find to be weirdly charming, endearing, dare I say, kind of adorable. Like, Sepultura work their fucking asses off on this record, and there's a, a, a very clear passion for black metal, for death metal, for thrash metal, and for what was then just considered extreme music evident throughout. This is a love letter to Venom, to Celtic Frost, to Bathory, and to other bands like Slayer and Metallica and Exodus, who at the time were just putting out some of their seminal works. As far as the music itself is concerned, there's not really a, a lot to talk about. Like, it's just ultimately kind of formulaic and cookie cutter. To be fair, this was probably pretty fucking mind-blowing at the time, but by the standards of 2022, I'm not really sure a lot of this holds up, or at the very least is as interesting as other black metal and other death metal that would eventually be released. But I enjoyed enough of this record that I would give this a 3 out of 5. Maybe not the most enthusiastic 3 out of 5, leaning towards a 2.5 out of 5, but a 3 out of 5 nonetheless. Like, if you're just looking for some really old school, primitive, kind of meat and potatoes, black and death metal, you really can't go wrong with this. Next up, we have Schizophrenia, released October 30th, 1987, via Cogumelo Records once again. This would be the band's first studio album with longtime guitarist Andreas Kisser. Uh, this also shows the band moving further away from their first wave black metal influences and leaning further into thrash and death metal influences, and I think it's a much stronger record as a result. The music is just a lot more focused, and it's a little bit more unique. It has a little bit more character and body. There's also a little bit more money being put into the production of the record. While still pretty raw and very primitive, uh, the, reefs, the, the riffs are a little punchier. They're a little more dynamic and muscular. The songs in general are just way more interesting too. There's a little bit more variety, there's a lot more technicality, it's brutal, it's sonically a lot heavier. You know, uh, tracks like Institution Symphonies are still kind of amazing, even all these years later. As are Screams Behind the Shadows, uh, To the Wall, the album's thunderous opening track from the past comes the storms. Like, it's, it's a really good album 
from start to finish. Um, so I'm going with a very enthusiastic 3.5 out of 5, leaning towards a 4 out of 5. Sepultura clearly paid a lot of attention to what they got right and what they got wrong about Morbid Visions. They applied it to this record, threw in some more thrash and heavy metal influence, upped the production, and made for a much better record without losing the, the charm and the passion of Morbid Visions. Next up, we have Beneath the Remains, released April 7th, 1988, via Roadrunner Records. Yes, believe it or not, there was a time when Roadrunner put out not just consistently good music, but consistently pretty brutal and gnarly music. That almost feels weird to say aloud, but, you know. C'est la vie. Times have changed. But even as times have changed, one thing has remained an undisputable fact. Beneath the Remains is a goddamn fucking banger. Everything Schizophrenia did so fucking well turned up to fucking 11. The beefiest fucking riffs, the gnarliest fucking breakdowns, the most in-your-face fucking vocals. The production is loud and cavernous and mighty. We have the mighty Scott Burns to thank for that. Uh, clearly he saw something in this young Brazilian thrash death metal band and thank god he did if i'm not mistaken he would go on to produce a few more records for them we will find out in a moment um this is just fantastic this this whole fucking record like there's not a single riff that doesn't make me just want to throw something the moment i hear it all these tracks are bona fide fucking ragers like i challenge you not to want to flip something the moment you hear anything from this record I mean, like, Inner Self, Mass Hypnosis, Slaves of Pain, Stronger Than Hate, Primitive Future. It's all fucking fantastic. It all fucking holds up. It's all super fucking gnarly. Even by the standards of today's music, this is seriously nasty shit. I do feel like it's a little bit more one-dimensional, musically speaking, than Schizophrenia, which at times I think was a little bolder and a little bit more technical, but... God damn, you know what? I don't think I fucking care. Like, this is one of those few instances where I'm like, you know what? The album's got riffs, and that's all I fucking want. That's all I fucking give two shits about. So fuck it. Four to five. It's a fucking great record, man. Uh, one of the best of their classic era. Maybe still one of their best albums from start to finish. At the very least, one of their most enjoyable. Like, I can put this on for any occasion, and it... it Guarantees to draw a reaction, guarantees to get people excited and, and motivated and pumped. Love this fucking record. I wish I had it on vinyl. Where did we see this on vinyl, Anna? We saw we saw Beneath the Remains at FYE in the Eaton Center, yeah? I think so, yeah. I'm going back to FYE then, because I want this thing on vinyl now. Next up, we have Arise, released March 25th, 1991, via Roadrunner Records once again. And we have arrived, ladies and gentlemen, at... Not only what is, in my opinion, Sepultura's best album, but what is undeniably my favorite album from Sepultura, and what I would consider to be a full-blown thrash metal, death metal masterpiece. Very much on par with Master of Puppets and Rust in Peace and, and tons of other like S-tier classic thrash records. Everything I loved about Schizophrenia... Everything I loved about Beneath the Remains with a lot more money, a way bigger budget, some of the best songwriting Sepultura has had to date, some of the best uh, performances and some of the best lyrics they've had to date. It, it's just a bona fide fucking banger of a record. It doesn't matter what instance I listen to this record. Like, it doesn't matter what's going on. I can listen to this while working out. I can listen to this while I'm relaxing. I can listen to this with friends. I can listen to it by myself. I can listen to it on a bright sunny day. I can listen to it while it's fucking storming outside. I don't fucking care. The circumstances don't matter. I love this record. You could play this at a fucking funeral. I will lose my goddamn mind the moment I hear desperate fucking cry. Same with Under Siege, uh, Dead Embryonic Cells, the title track Arise, which will never not make me want to just shout and scream and like 
punch the nearest motherfucker. There's a bit more of an experimental edge to this record, which I like. There's influences from industrial music, from hardcore punk, from Latin and Brazilian world music, indigenous music, which I think is really, really, really fucking exciting and kind of shows us, gives us a glimpse rather at what Sepultura would soon be building up to with records like Chaos AD, at Roots, and a lot of the Derek Green stuff. Production-wise, I would actually argue that this is also Scott Burns' best record, which I know is saying a lot because he's produced a lot of classic records for Morbid Angel, uh, Cannibal Corpse, Napalm Death, and so many more, but my fucking god, the size, the scale, and the feel of this record is just in-fucking-sane. Five out of five, without fucking question for me. I fucking love this record. It's a fucking masterpiece. It's fucking perfect. I would die for this record. Uh, I probably will one day die for this record. I would also like to be buried with a vinyl copy of this fucking record because I love this fucking record. Next up, we have Chaos AD, released September 2nd, 1993 via Roadrunner and Epic Records. Uh, this one is, is, is very different in comparison to Beneath the Remains and Arise. Um, aesthetically it's very similar, but musically things are slowed down. This is closer to what I would describe as groove metal. There are still a lot of thrashy riffs and beats, but there's more tribal Brazilian percussion brought in. There are some slower rhythms, some more breakdowns, some more like muscular, almost hardcore style passages, and it makes for... Uh, a very unique album. I hesitate to say a great record. This is one that's more of a, a grower than a shower, in my opinion, but there's still plenty of fun to be had with this thing. Um, and it's interesting looking back on this record because I think this would end up becoming one of their most important albums. Like, as beloved as Beneath the Remains and Arise are, they would not continue to inform Sepultura's sound and evolution the way that Chaos AD would. Like, from here we have a clear path towards records like Roots and Against and a lot of the other uh, Derek Green Sepultura stuff that would come afterwards. Uh, it's got a very unique feel and vibe. It's It's got these huge, burly fucking grooves. The percussion across this thing is so exciting and invigorating. It's easily the most interesting thing about this record. You've got Nomad, which has these slow brooding grooves, which Andreas Kisser has compared to Metallica Sad But True, even going as far as to say that Nomad is their answer, their equivalent to a track like that. You've got Refuse Resist, which has a lot of different styles of Afro-Brazilian percussion and drumming all throughout. Uh, the song actually starts with uh, the heartbeat of Max's son, Zion Cavalera, being used to kind of introduce the whole thing, which is just really sweet and really cool. Lyrically, too, this thing just bleeds pure hardcore punk energy. And speaking of hardcore punk, Biotech is Godzilla is a straight-up hardcore fucking rager. It, it honestly borders on what we would eventually come to expect from, like, 90s metalcore. It's not, in my opinion, as consistent or as exhilarating as uh, Beneath the Remains or Arise, but it is still very interesting. I am I remain invested throughout the album's duration. I think there are a lot of really, really, really cool songs, some of which we haven't mentioned, like uh, Slave New World, uh, Kawaias. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Point is, it's a really good record, so 3.5 out of 5. Definitely check this out. Um... If you love records like the upcoming Roots, and if you uh, haven't already, just because it's a good record. What, what more do you need to know? Fucking honestly. And speaking of Roots, Boom! Roots! Released February 20th, 1996 in Europe, and May 12th, 1996 in the United States. And I'm going to assume the rest of, of North America as well. It was released through Roadrunner Records. And Anna, if I'm not mistaken, this is your favorite Sepultura album, is it not? Yes. There we go. Much like how Arise expanded on everything that Schizophrenia and Beneath the Remains did so well, Roots expands on everything Chaos AD does so well. The grooves are thicker, the indigenous and tribal Afro-Brazilian uh, percussion is more prominent throughout the record, there are uh, native woodwind instruments and indigenous chanting throughout the record. Vocally, I would argue that this is Max's most aggressive record with Sepultura, maybe 
in general, like in his entire career, like he really is just shouting and roaring at you across the entirety of this fucking thing. And he's doing so with the help of some pretty big name fucking talent. I mean, you've got David Silveria and Jonathan Davis from Korn. You've got Mike Patton from Faith No More and Mr. Bungle. You've got DJ Lethal from Limp Biscuit. You've got a gentleman by the name of Carn Car Carlinhos Brown on the track Ratha Mahata. I don't know much about him, but it says here he's a Brazilian singer, percussionist, and record producer from Salvador Bahia. His music style blends funk, Latin music, R&B, soul, reggae, tradition Brazilian percussion. Guess what? All of that is absolutely present on Ratha Mahata. Since we're on the topic, that coincidentally is my favorite song on this fucking record. I love this fucking thing. I, I love the native indigenous chanting and the percussion. I love the trade-offs that Car Carlinhos has with Max. I like their vocal chemistry. I like the way they trade off of each other. I like how he's just doing kind of his, his traditional uh, vocal singing, his traditional chanting, whereas Max is kind of screaming it back in this really vicious, bloodthirsty kind of echo chamber. The title track, Roots, Bloody Roots, is, is fucking iconic as well. I mean, that main riff is super simplistic, but so effective. It's muddy, it's it's dirty. Just like Rata Mahata, I don't really trust anyone that doesn't fucking vibe with this thing. Aside from Look Away, which is where most of the big name talent pops up, I do think that the album slows down and has a bit of a lull in the middle, but it picks up right at the end with like Dictatorship and Canyon Jam and Endangered Species. So, you know, I, I don't really have too many complaints. It's unique, it's exciting. In retrospect, this album was also like hugely influential on like new metal and alternative metal. I mean, for God's sakes, fucking members of Korn and Limp Bizkit are on here, so that says a lot right goddamn there. I'm feeling a strong four to five on this. I think this is a great record. It's not my favorite Sepultura record, but it very clearly is for a generation of people. Like, it's Anna's favorite record, as as she's already told you. Uh, Suicide Silence and a lot of other, like, deathcore bands have cited Sepultura, and specifically this record as being a huge influence on their sound and on their development, which I think is really interesting. I would say of all of Sepultura's records, this is probably one of their most accessible. So if you're looking for a really great entry point into this band and their massive discography, Roots is definitely the record to check out. And now this brings us to Against, released October 6th, 1998 via Roadrunner Records. This would be Sepultura's first record with Derek Green. Max Cavalera was fired at some point in between the release of Roots and uh, Against. To be honest, I'm to this day still not entirely sure what happened. From what I understand, there was some kind of dispute because Max's wife was the band's manager and the rest of the band weren't getting along with her. Something like that. I don't really know. I also don't really care because it's not my fucking business. Here's what I do know. Max isn't in the band, but Derek is. And for a lot of people, this is where they stop paying attention to Sepultura. And I can kind of understand why to a certain extent, because the Derek Green era is super hit and miss. But honestly, in the case of Against, I don't really get it. Because this album is pretty much just diet roots. It's it's Roots 1.5. It, it very much feels like a lot of the stuff that got cut from Roots... And now Derek is on vocals. And I ob obviously, as a result, it's not as strong as Roots, but does it make for a really bad album? No, not at all. Like, it definitely feels like people just never gave this guy a shot whatsoever until more recent records like uh, Machine Mashaya and Quadra. And, and, you know, so be it. Sometimes that's just the way it is when you're standing in for a really iconic singer, you know, like... Sammy Hagar still gets shit to this day for filling in for uh, David Lee Roth. Phil Collins still gets shit to this day for filling in for Peter Gabriel. Like, that is sometimes just what fucking happens. But, you know, it it, it, it still sucks. Like, I feel bad for Derek on some level. But C'est La Vie, as far as Against is concerned as a standalone record, I think it's fine. It's all right. Uh, like I said, it does a lot of what Roots did well. It doesn't feel as authentic. It doesn't feel as powerful, but there are still some pretty interesting jams on here. Like, I always really like tracks like Choke and Boycott and Kamaitachi. 
Uh, I do think there's a lot of filler on this record. I think this thing feels longer than Roots, despite being significantly shorter. Um, but yeah, all things considered, I, I don't really have any major concerns or complaints with this thing. It, it does feel pretty derivative um, of Roots, duh, but fuck it. If you're going to borrow, you may as well borrow from what was, at the time, your most well-known and commercially successful record. So I I'm not really that upset. I'm feeling a 3 out of 5 for this one. Not an enthusiastic one, but a 3 out of 5 nonetheless. If you really loved Roots and you are totally fine with the idea of someone other than Max singing for Sepultura, then you're probably going to enjoy this record too. Next up, we have Nation, released March 20th, 2001 via Roadrunner Records, and I gotta be honest, I, I think this is a genuinely underrated album. Like, this is one of the more unique records uh, that Sepultura would record with Derek in these early years. It's one of their most provocative records. Uh, it very heavily leans into the groove metal and the new metal influences of the last three studio albums. Uh, the production is better. Uh, there's a lot of guest stars on this record, just like some of the last couple, and it's just all around a pretty well-made record. Like, it's it's pretty good. It's it's fun. There's lots of gnarly grooves, lots of fun beats. Uh, Derek sounds fucking great on vocals. Like, he sounds way more confident and comfortable on this thing than he did on Against. It just makes for a fun time. Like, uh, the opening track, Seppel Nation, I think is great. Revolt is great, One Man Army, Vox Populi. I really like uh, the collabs on here, like Politrix featuring Jello Biafra of the Dead Kennedys, uh, Human Cause featuring Jamie Josta of Hatebreed. There's the instrumental piece, Valito, at the very end, which features uh, a very young Apocalyptica. I think at the time they were still like a Metallica, symphonic metal, cello tribute band too. Like they weren't doing original music just yet. So this is kind of interesting to, to look back on. And I'm learning that what I just said is not entirely true, because they had released three albums by this point. But one of them was a full-blown Metallica tribute record, and one of them also had a bunch of other Metallica covers on it. So, you know, what I said is still slightly valid, just ever so slightly. The point is, Nation, honestly, kind of underrated. I would give this... Let's go with a very enthusiastic 3.5 out of 5. Um... Yeah, I, I genuinely really like this album. I, I hope that after this video, this is an album that more people check out. I don't really know if this album was a big hit. I don't think it was. The Derek Green era in general just does not resonate with a lot of people, as we've discussed. But I'm, I'm hoping y'all check out at least this record, because I think this is the best of, like the 2000s uh, Sepultura stuff. At the very least, one of the most interesting and one of the most provocative and one of the most poignant still to this day. Like, there's a lot of stuff that this album talks about that I think is still pretty relevant. Next up, we have Roarback, released May 27th, 2003, via SPV and Universal. Uh, Roadrunner is no longer involved. You can kind of tell, because there's not as much money being put into this thing. There aren't as many guest stars. The album is not as provocative or as unique as we've come to expect from Sepultura. It does feel like a very meat and potatoes kind of early 2000s groove metal, alternative metal record. Not bad per se, just not really that interesting to talk about. I mean, I guess in comparison to what other bands were putting out at this time, like other groove alternative new metal bands, it's fine, like, I would choose this over whatever the fuck, uh, Papa Roach or, or fucking Corn were putting out of this time, but, you know, it's, it's, it's still not, it's, it's, it's still not really that great. I do like lyrically how bleak, almost nihilistic Sepultura are on this record, like, they paint a very black and white picture of the world, they talk a lot about political corruption on this thing, and that's interesting, but, the songs themselves, you know, they, they lack the power of something like the previous record Nation did. And they lack the power even of other records like Roots and Arise and Chaos AD, which did also go into very political and bleak territory. The biggest issue of this record is that it's really bloated, though, and it also ends on a really, really, really bad note. Like, there's an outro track literally called Outro, which is basically just 11 minutes of noise and, and screaming that just gradually gets louder and more chaotic. And it's then followed by Bullet the Blue Sky, 
which is a, originally a U2 song, and Sepultura's version of this song is horrible. It's, it's, it's not good. It's a very not good out of five. It's fucking terrible. The most cringy, mopey ass fucking diet non point shit I've I've honestly heard in in some time. Re listening to this album was the first time I heard "Bullet the Blue Sky," and I'm hoping it's also the last time I hear "Bullet the Blue Sky." Um, I'm thinking overall this is a two point five out of five. It's it's really not that bad. Like, you know, if you just love like. Uh, machine head and you're really in love with you know against a nation then you'll probably get some fun out of this uh but yeah it's it's not my cup of tea at all it's it's not horrible but it's it's not great it's it's just kind of okay next up we have dante 11 released march 14th 2006 via spv this would end up being the band's final album with igor cavalera on drums both the cavaleras are gone after this point which uh, not, not great for some of the late 2000s material, but as far as Dante 11 is concerned, uh, I think this is also another kind of underrated record. Not as strong as Nation in my opinion, uh, but conceptually speaking, this is one of their more ambitious records, and musically this is just a lot tighter and a lot more consistent than Roarback, than Against, and then a lot of material that will soon follow this. The band is once again re-exploring thrash metal and hardcore music on this record, combining it with the groove metal sound of the last few. Conceptually, the thing is based on uh, three sections of Dante Alighieri's The Divine Comedy, Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso. It's a very provocative and cinematic album as a result. There's a lot of catharsis. There's a lot of atmosphere. Sepultura take advantage of uh, Dante's works and they expand it into thrash groove metal hellscapes like Darkwood of Error, Convicted in Life, uh, Nuclear 7, Repeating the Horror, Crown and Mitre. Like, th these are legitimately some really strong cuts. And uh, Derek... Is, is clearly a Dante fan, because vocally I would say that this is one of his strongest records from the 2000s Sepultura uh, body of work. Definitely right up there with Nation in that regard. Like, it's a strong record for sure. I think overall I would give this a 3.5 out of 5. Not as enthusiastic as the aforementioned Nation, which edges this out just a little bit. But yeah, this is honestly a really, really, really good record. Next up, we have Alex, released January 23rd, 2009, via SPV. This is one of two or three records that they would record with Jean de la Bello, brand new drummer. Igor Cavalera, as we've mentioned, has left the band. This record was pretty well received at the time, and I can see why. Like, musically, this thing is a little bit more diverse. There's influence from across Sepultura's discography here. There's groove metal, death metal, thrash metal, hardcore punk. Still some, like, new metal-ish bits and pieces as well. Um, it's also just like uh, Dante Eleven based on the Divine Comedy. It's conceptually, I guess, seen as kind of a sequel to Dante Eleven. But, you know, despite all that, this album just isn't really doing anything for me. I don't really know how to explain it per se, but this thing just does not really connect with me. I think there are good songs on here. Filthy Rot in particular. That's a fucking banger. And in general, this record has a kind of chaos to it, a kind of menace to it that I really like. It weirdly reminds me of, like, some of the 90s Napalm Def stuff, or even some of the stuff that Napalm Def were releasing in the 2000s, albeit without the, the grindcore. But despite that, this thing just isn't resonating with me, and I can't even really put my finger on it. I don't know, man, despite this album's best efforts and intentions, it ends up occupying a space kind of like Roarback for me, where I'm just like, yeah, it's fine, you know, it's 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 just fine. It's It feels kind of meat and potatoes, um, despite its ambitions. It, it feels slightly run-of-the-mill to a certain extent, like just kind of a, a, a lazy hodgepodge of everything the band have done beforehand, but... It's louder and heavier, and therefore I guess it's better, depending on who you ask. Again, I don't think it's horrible. I do think there are some good songs on here. I think everyone, you know, performing pretty fucking well. Jean's percussion in particular. He's a solid drummer. 
But yeah, despite all of that, it just isn't hitting me. It's not sticking with me. Like, I actually forgot about this album entirely before we started working on, on this fucking video. I'm happy I did re-listen to it because, again, I do think there are some strong songs, but when I come back to this as often as other Sepultura records, even some of the other Derek stuff, like Nation, uh, like Dante Eleven, absolutely not. For me, God, I want to go with, like, a very enthusiastic 2.5 out of 5. Like, it's not my cup of tea, it's not doing anything for me, but there is some objectively really good stuff on here, there's a lot of passion, there's a lot of good ideas, so... You know, it could be one of those scenarios where I just, I'm, I'm just full of fucking shit. Maybe this album caught me at the wrong time. Maybe it caught me in the wrong mood. I don't fucking know. Doesn't matter. It didn't do a thing for me despite its best efforts and ambitions. Not much I can really do about that. But I don't think it's horrible. So check it out, especially if you like Dante Eleven and uh, if you liked a lot of the other, you know, if you like Nation. There's, there's, there is stuff here worth checking out. Next up we have Kairos, released June 24th, 2011 via Nuclear Blast Records. Um, I was just flat out bored by this. Yeah, I don't have anything positive to say whatsoever. I, I was legitimately flat out fucking bored by this. This feels like a worse version of Roarback, but with a few thrashy riffs. Um, I'll give credit to Alex. It was at least ambitious in a lot of ways, even if it didn't stick with me. This, this doesn't. I, I do think there's a concept to it, but like, I don't know. It's just not interesting at all. The music is not interesting. It's, it feels very run of the mill. It lacks the impact and the intensity of what I expect from Sepultura. And it's just really, really forgettable, like really boring, like even the best bits and pieces, even the best riffs and the best courses on here, I just do not give two fucking shits about. Honestly, 1.5 out of 5. It's, it's super fucking boring. I would argue it's Sepultura's worst album. It's, it's bad. I would rather move on and talk about something else, something a little bit more fun, something a little bit more good. Next up, we have The Mediator Between Head and Hands is the Heart, released October 25th in Europe, October 28th in the UK, and October 29th in North America, all in 2013. Nuclear Blast Records. Um, this is the band's first album with Eloy Casagrande, who is the band's current drummer. He was still a teenager at the time, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is also Sepultura's first album working with Ross Robinson in a long time, who previously worked on Roots. And these little changes here make a world of fucking difference. This is the most urgent and the most brutal I think Sepultura have sounded in a while. Like, this thing is really, really intense, really chaotic, uh, guitars and, and percussion and vocals just flailing all around the fucking place. Um, at times it almost has the intensity of like a blackened death metal or a grindcore record. It is sonically very dark and very extreme as well. Eloy Casagrande, an absolute fucking savage on this fucking record. Like, oh my fucking god. He clearly lit a fucking fire under Sepultura's ass for this thing, because they play their fucking asses off too. There's a lot of good shit on here. There's the Vatican, which is this lurching and very like apocalyptic kind of like blackened groove thrash metal rager with a really nice introductory piece. There's the Bliss of Ignorance, Manipulation of Tragedy, Trauma of War, Obsessed, featuring Dave Lombardo, who, you know, <laughs> killing it, duh. This, by sheer coincidence, was one of the first Sepultura albums I listened to because this came out when I was starting to really get into a lot of thrash and death metal, namely Sepultura. I think at the time I was slightly overwhelmed by the chaos, by the intensity of this thing. Uh, but honestly, now I, I think it's kind of awesome. Like, it's, it's a great record. This is easily a 4 out of 5 for me. I love the feel. I love the vibe of this whole thing. It's, 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 it's really fucking great. Yeah, that's, that's all I gotta say, honestly. With that in mind, let's jump into Machine Messiah, released January 17th, 2017, via Nuclear Blast and Sony Music. 
This thing fucking slaps, dude. This thing is fucking awesome. It's the band's most ambitious record in a while, their most progressive record in a while, their most diverse, their heaviest record in a while. It's pulling influence from everywhere. Like, there are moments on this record that border on full-blown prog metal. Um, it's their most dynamic. It's their punchiest. In a lot of ways, it reminds me of Arise. It's just really just an awesome fucking record. I, I don't know how to really phrase it. Like, I remember when this came out, I was kind of thrown off guard by this because I didn't really care much for uh, the Derek Green Sepultura era for a while. But um, yeah, this is great. And I think a lot of people, you know, started looking at Sepultura differently now because of this, because this was like critically acclaimed across the board, if I'm not mistaken. The concept is very interesting on this thing. Uh, as the band writes, the main inspiration behind Machine Messiah is the robotization of our society nowadays. The concept of a god machine who created humanity, and now it seems that this cycle is closing itself, returning to the standing point. We came from machines, and we're going back to where we came from. The Messiah, when he returns, will be a robot or a humanoid, our biomechanical savior. That's wild. That sounds like if, if fucking James Cameron tried to rewrite the Bible. Like, that's weird. That's wild. That's crazy. That's scary. Cyber God, Sworn O, Phantom Self, I'm the Enemy, Iceberg Dances. Legit one of the best songs Sepultura have ever made. One of the best instrumentals at the very fucking least. So many fucking fantastic songs. Uh, the production here is fucking insane. Derek sounds amazing. Andreas sounds amazing. Eloy sounds amazing. Everyone sounds fucking amazing. Honestly, solid 4.5 out of 5 for me. It's an incredible fucking record. Like, if you have not listened to this record, then you need to go do that immediately. Please and thank you. And finally, this brings us to Quadra, the band's most recent studio album, released February 7th, 2020 via Nuclear Blast and BMG. Honestly, you can just take everything I said about Machine Messiah and you can apply it here. Like, it's it's big, it's cinematic, it's beautiful, it's fantastic. It's also, spoiler alert, gonna get a 4.5 out of 5, but since we're here, let's talk about it a little bit so I can justify that score. The concept of this album is genuinely brilliant. Dare I say, kind of genius. It's split into four separate sections, each one based on an individual element of the quadrivirum, which uh, is comprised of the four arts, astronomy, arithmetic, uh, geometry, and music. The album also acts as a kind of weird retrospective of Sepultura's entire discography, like the first few songs are some very classic kind of thrash metal songs in the vein of what we might expect from schizophrenia leading up to something like Arise. The second portion of the album, meanwhile, is based on what we heard on records like Roots and Against and Chaos AD. And the last two pieces of this record are heavily inspired by a lot of the ideas and, and arrangements that we heard previously on Machine Messiah with the third piece being specifically inspired by the aforementioned Iceberg Dances, whereas the fourth piece is slower, more melodic, doomier, very much in the vein of the title track Machine Messiah. It's just really fascinating. It makes for a very dynamic and a very diverse record, which I, I fucking love. Um, despite, you know, the concept, despite all of the different genres and sounds being represented here, it never feels overwhelming. The album is actually pretty well trimmed, clocking in at a sharp 51 minutes. And honestly, every song on here is just fucking fantastic. There's not a single piece of filler. Everything has purpose. Everything is fun to listen to. I, I really love this album. Uh, I'm feeling a strong 4.5 out of 5. Like, very strong. There's a part of me that almost wants to go 5 out of 5 because this is just so ambitious and so creative and so clever. But I'm, I'm going to stick to a 4.5 out of 5 uh, myself personally. Although I wouldn't, sh I wouldn't blame anyone for giving this a 5 out of 5 because honestly, this is awesome. And that is it. Voila, we talked about 15 studio albums. Oh my fucking God, they vary in quality. They vary in, in sound and concept, but that's cool. That's exciting. I'm happy we did this. Sepultura is an awesome band with an awesome discography. They're, this is definitely one of the most interesting videos I think I've done of this style because every album is so different and so unique for the most part. 
Um, let me know what your favorite Sepultura album is. Let me know what your least favorite Sepultura album is. Let me know how you would rank each uh, album in their discography. Let me know what score you would give it. Blah, 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 blah. Press this button to subscribe to the Metal Meltdown and get updates on it e-fucking immediately in case you somehow are not already. And as always, you have yourself a fantastic fucking day.